Thank you all for, uh, for your attention so far this morning, and I'm very pleased to introduce the final session of the morning on um, behaviour and social policy. Um, so if our keynote speaker would like to come up and uh, load her slides, thank you. I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Monica Schochspana, joining us today all the way from the United States, from the Johns Hopkins Centre for Health Security, where she's an anthropologist working as part of a multidisciplinary team to, on public health emergency management. And she's going to be speaking today about the public and public health policy, lost and found opportunities for managing epidemics. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. So I'm a social scientist, which is why I am very clumsy with the tech. Um, so uh, I, I have really a placeholder, uh, let's see, placeholder. That's a placeholder title. So. What I want to talk to you about is how I think that social policies in connection with epidemics and pandemics still need to evolve. And by social policies, I mean those strategies by which government and other institutions uh, uh, structure uh, or drive their efforts to protect and enable human safety, security, health, and well being. And I'm going to use the 2022 United States National Biodefense Strategy and Implementation Plan as a bellwether. It happened to have been released a couple of weeks ago, and I thought it would just be a good mechanism to talk about these things. My work is on domestic public health emergency management in the United States, so please, uh, if you will indulge my uh, domestic US perspective. Um, so I'm going to review the biodefense strategy, the latest one, but from the perspective of a medical anthropologist who uh, co-directed with my colleague, Dr. Emily Brunson, the Communivax Coalition. Uh, and that is a rapid ethnographic uh, research to action coalition focused on COVID-19 vaccine equity. So I'm going to just give you a little briefing on Communivax, uh, briefing on the National Biodefense Strategy, and then critically reflect on how the National Biodefense Strategy uh, has advanced thinking and practice in the United States, but it's still partial. It's not comprehensive if you're thinking more in terms of social policies, three themes of information, inequality, and infrastructure, and then I'll conclude. So Communivax had its origins in the spring of 2020 when uh, Emily, a medical anthropologist who works on vaccine hesitancy, and myself, who's worked in public health emergency management for over 20 years, put our heads together and said, you know, there's a train wreck that's going to happen. We have the United States federal government pouring billions of dollars into Operation Warp Speed which was the effort to support de uh, uh, accelerated development and deployment of safe and effective SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. There was nothing spent on the vaccine coverage side. It was all on the production side. Um, and so we had convened a multidisciplinary group that included vaccinologists, social scientists, and public health experts to say, look, we have some time on our hands. Here is what we do know about vaccine hesitancy and factors that support vaccine confidence. We need to really step up our work in this area while whilst the uh, scientists were working on uh, new vaccines and the logisticians were thinking about how to do distribute them. At the same time, there were early polls that said that there were higher rates of vaccine hesitancy among uh, African American, Hispanic, Latino, and indigenous communities in the United States that simultaneously were being hurt by greater rates of infection, hospitalization, and deaths. So the Communivex Coalition 
has a, has a national hub um, uh, with a national advisory group and six, uh, actually seven local teams, um, six teams uh, active in seven local areas. These are teams that already had roots and um, uh, a legacy of research within local African American and uh, Hispanic Latino populations. Um, and we also, the hub was connected to a number of national organizations so we could move the findings, the ethnographic research findings. Uh, we have pivoted from a, a, an original focus on COVID-19 vaccine equity to more enduring shifts within public health uh, systems in the United States that would focus on strengthening the community health sector, um, which in our country is very poorly developed uh, for a number of reasons. There's our funding systems prioritize curative medicine over health promotion and prevention. Um, there is a, a hierarchy between biomedical uh, authoritative knowledge and local voices. Uh, and then also, um, also a focus, well, the sort of a biomedical understanding that disaggregates individual illness from social determinants. So we've, we've broadened our focus. So let's get to the national biodefense strategy. So my critique of this is really informed by this ground level rapid ethnography and community engaged research around equity in the COVID-19 vaccination um, campaign in the United States. So essentially, in this, uh, uh, this may compare pretty similarly to other um, national strategies. And the, don't be uh, put off by the word biodefense or be put off by the word biodefense. Um, it's, it is used to ref, refer to a biothread of any kind, whether it's natural, accidental, or deliberate in origin. Uh, and so the outcome that the federal government is interested in is health, prosperity, and security of the American people. And the intervention to get to that is to stop infectious disease um, in the source and rapidly and effectively contain biological incidents. So we've got uh, medical countermeasures, surveillance and detection, the better integration of public health, veterinary health, and plant health infrastructure, um, a coordinated, comprehensive, equitable response, and then an equitable recovery strategy. So those are the main uh, uh, um, the main points or objectives in the strategy. So, as an anthropologist who's worked, medical anthropologist who's worked in this field for 20 years, I'm like, wow, big changes. Coronavirus really has shaken up the way in which mainstream biodefense strategy has been approached. So, there's a focus, there's always been a focus in the United States on having cutting edge technologies really contribute to a robust biodefense enterprise. They're now talking about sociological achievements because of the problem that we have had with regard to um, access and acceptance issues around vaccination, but also uh, social conflict as it's related to masking and also uh, social distancing. They've talked about modernizing our public health infrastructure and about strengthening public trust in medicine, science, and health. And social and behavioral sciences have been elevated as an important part of the biodefense enterprise. This is all an incredible break with the past. Um, you know, this is, this is on paper. So, but there, there are three areas where the biodefense strategy is still um, only, partially, uh, only partially going to be effective as it, as it would be implemented in its current state. And the first of three is information, and then I'll touch on inequality and in infrastructure. So the, the biodefense strategy 
elevates the importance of public messaging and public education. So health information is seen as the precious resource that's going to lead to public compliance with regard to public health interventions. In fact, they have set a target within the biodefense strategy of reaching 85% vaccine coverage within the entire population by way of public messaging. That's the, that's the sort of the cause effect that they're hoping for. The assumption here is that once people get the science, they'll get vaccinated. And that has not played out. Um, and learnings from the Communivax uh, coalition is that, yes, of course, making health information relevant and meaningful and easily acceptable in the, your own language does make a difference. But it's not the only thing. Social norms and also material factors that affect your ability to access vaccine are also critical. So uh, an example from our Idaho group, working with local Hispanic farm workers in rural Idaho, um, a very under-resourced public health department. So our ethnographic research team worked as something of a social and behavioral health annex to the local public health department, because they just didn't have that capability. And so our researchers would meet regularly with the health uh, officers, sharing what they were discovering about um, local perceptions about the disease, responses to vaccination, uh, and just the overall pandemic experience. Uh, and they pointed out to the health officers two things. One, that they were hearing uh, these uh, farm working communities stress the importance of getting tested and getting vaccinated as it relates to their value on work. That is staying healthy enough to work working to provide for one's family, and working to indicate to one's neighbors that you are a good citizen in the community. And so what the health department decided to do, moving away from mass vaccination, was to hold vaccine clinics actually on site at farms and also food processing facilities that employed a number of Hispanic um, workers. Uh, and also, they, they turned away from mass vaccination being held at the, at the local health department building because of the perception that on the part of the farm workers that they would have to prove when they went to a government facility that they were in the country legally. And so there was a deterrence factor. So going to people and offering them vaccine in line with their social values and in, in really raise the uh, vaccine coverage rates in this community. So uh, yes, health information and paying attention to social norms and structural barriers. A second uh, place where the US biodefense um, strategy in its current state um, has improved is a focus on equity, equity in response domestically and also taking measures uh, to, this, uh, to the extent uh, that it contributes to enhance global security. Um, the thing is about the biodefense strategy though is there's an assumption that equity in biodefense depends on better operations. And of course it does. Just as I was discussing that Idaho example, bringing vaccines to people in alignment with their social values will improve vaccination experiences. So initially, uh, when the vaccines became first available more broadly, uh, there was a focus on using mass media messages and mass vaccination approaches 
in order to reach population immunity as quickly as possible. The trouble is that formula of intervention did not work well, particularly for lower income communities of color. What did work well were hyper-local, peer-led, neighborhood-based vaccine experiences. In the case of our Maryland group, they, they worked with local barbershops and hair salons, black-owned barbershops and hair salons, um, and helped uh, with training around vaccines so that when these hair professionals had people in their chairs talking about girlfriends and boyfriends, they brought in issues of vaccine in a non-judgmental, comfortable way. They also hosted vaccine clinics on site. These were familiar, comfortable, feeling safe places where people could get vaccinated. Um, and that, that type of formula worked better. So of course, biodefense operations, yes, let's make them more equitable. At the same time, equity in biodefense does not begin with the response. And the biodefense strategy does think about uh, the enterprise as being turned on effectively when a pathogen or biothreat emerges. It's not about pre-existing social determinants of health. So we had with coronavirus social amplifiers for risk of infection and hospitalization and death, the chronic daily stresses that people of lower income and people of color face, chronic diseases that were poorly managed because they don't have good access to health care, and living, working, and transportation situations that provided the occasion for greater exposure to the virus, and also a history of untrustworthiness by medical and public health institutions in the United States. So yes, let's have equitable biodefense operations, but let's also go upstream to these issues of race and class that affect people's uh, susceptibility and exposure to um, things such as SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the last area where the biodefense strategy is only partially there is under infrastructure. Um, what was really striking to me is the focus on, yes, making our infrastructure more robust. Um, but also making sure that people could have faith and confidence in it. That is something new. Um, and, and again, there's still a focus more on information. But the assumption here is that modernizing our infrastructure that supports the biodefense mission, really is gonna take more lab coats and lines of code. So many of the current assessments of the need to modernize the public health infrastructure in the United States focus on more epidemiologists, including animal disease epidemiologists, uh, technicians uh, in informatics, and better laboratories. But while we do need all that, we also need a sustainably financed community-centric workforce. And that means workers in the community and workers in the health department that can connect with communities. So um, that's why CommuniVax has started focusing more on what will it take to create a strong, socially valued, sustainable, community-based workforce that can help people navigate, um, navigate things uh, both during steady state or peacetime, but also during an emergencies. So really pushing for uh, greater support for community health workers. And in the health department, while we're also hiring more epidemiologists, more infor information specialists, and more laboratorians, um, thank you long distance uh, right over here, uh, we also need to be hiring 
more translators, more social media strategists, more health promoters, um, more, in, more of anything that is about connecting with people. You have to have an infrastructure in order to produce and sustain public trust in the biodefense enterprise. So to conclude, am I on time? Okay. Uh, is if it's really going to be effective, the biodefense enterprise in the United States has to account for the social context in which it performs. Currently, right now, it thinks of bio threats and biological incidents as bounded happenings with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we know in a social determinants of health model that it's long before the pathogen emerges as far as how you protect the safety, security, and the health and well-being of a population. We also know that when someone engages in a protective action, like getting vaccinated, they're not following the rational man model of, oh, I just need that fact, and then I'm going to go act on it. It really is about, will this protective action not only protect me, but is it in alignment with my own and my community's own values, things that we hold precious to us, and is it practical, is it feasible for me to even get vaccinated? Can I step away from work? Can I take my children with me or leave them with somebody else? Um, am I going to lose income if I disappear for three hours to go get vaccinated? So all of those material conditions have to be planned for. Uh, a comprehensive strategy for health equity would take on the social determinants question and also structural inequalities as it relates to racism and wealth distribution. And if the biodefense enterprise is going to be considered trustworthy in the middle of an emergency, it has to have earned that reputation long before any pathogen emerges. Um, and so we have to have routine touch points, both for public health and also healthcare, that are affirming and validating for people on an everyday basis. So um, with that, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to join you here today. I've really enjoyed meeting you all and learning from you. I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you so much, Monica, for an sure. absolutely fascinating presentation. <laughs> really enjoyed that. Great. And some great um, practical examples as well of implementation of that, that principle of the importance great. of the human factors. Um, any questions the audience think? Yes? Sorry, can I just repeat that for the recording? So that was engagement yes. between ethnographic researchers and policymakers. Right. Well, policymakers are influenced in multiple ways. Some of them are influenced by quantitative data. Others are, uh, are moved more by storytelling and narrative. And that's where the ethnographers in the room have a leg up on others. And then also issues of their own social network. They are influenced by uh, how others think and feel in their own networks. So the thing is, and this is from the side of having run Communivax, um, uh, while I work more with policymakers, Emily works more with university-based researchers. And it was oftentimes very difficult for the university-based researchers to engage in what we call disaster science, which is basically coming, coming to policymakers, coming decision make, to decision makers with data quickly, even if it's incomplete, in order to inform an urgent situation in which there are high human stakes. 
And a lot of the ethnographers, reasonably so, like any researcher, wanted to get it right. And it's like, well, instead of 100 interviews, what are 20 telling you? Because we need to get the information sooner rather than later. So, you know, um, it's like producing, uh, well, you don't want to compromise ethics. There's an acceleration of exploration and investigation that has to take place in an emergent situation. And there were researchers who were not comfortable with that because it wasn't familiar. Um, and so I think more social and behavioral researchers need to learn how to operationalize their findings. Um, and in the United States, that's been very difficult. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Did I see another hand? Sorry, I think over yes. here. Uh, so misinformation and disinformation, it, it depended on the community. And so, so there's, been a, there's been an awareness of a general or more universal hesitancy among African Americans towards medical and public health institutions given current medical racism and then historical experimentation. So there's that history. At the same time, in local communities, there are localized narratives around that. Yes, people will invoke some things like Tuskegee, but they'll also pull out a particular hospital or a particular relationship uh, with a provider that went poorly. So there's a really localized incarnation of the the sense that certain institutions are not trustworthy. So that's why the face-to-face, follow-on type of engagement, the infrastructure that's more about interpersonal connection is so important. That's, you cannot fix lack of trust in a top-down fashion. You cannot. It has to be bottom-up. And we have to have the infrastructure to do that to more community health workers. So thank you for that question, and over to... Thank you very much. Yes, the one where you Here, let me put this on. Pretty quick. So thank you all. I think if anyone has any more questions uh, for Monica, then there'll be time in the lunchtime break. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jamie Garcia Iglesias from the University of Edinburgh, where he is a Mildred Baxter postdoctoral fellow in the Centre for Biomedicine, Self and Society and his research focuses on the intersection of sex, health, and technology. Yeah, thank you. Thank you um, also to the network for funding us uh, and to Paul for getting us here in the first place. So I don't know how many of you remember in April 2020, a long time ago, when the UN Secretary General said that COVID was the largest and the biggest challenge the world faced since the World War, and uh, Bill Gates saying that COVID was the first modern pandemic. And as HIV scientists, well, not so much scientists, but social scientists, we knew in Edinburgh that that was not the case. That beyond the flu influ or the influenza pandemic of 1918, the AIDS crisis in the 80s and the 90s was a much more closer and relevant antecedent. And we were very much shocked that it was being ignored left and right by policymakers and by public agents uh, throughout the US, the UK, and other countries. So we wanted to figure out what, the, what memories and experiences from the AIDS crisis are being mobilized to make solutions for COVID-19. And we wanted to focus in particular on HIV activists, who are still, many of them lived through the AIDS crisis, they were still working as activists in the UK and in the US and other countries. And how are they mobilizing those memories to manage this new crisis? And to do so, we did some rapid research with a focus group and interviews with a large organization here in the UK. And we produced a report which you can access online. You'll have the link later. But essentially, what we found was that there were certain organizational characteristics 
that made these people particularly adept at providing new answers for COVID-19. And following with what Monica says, it was their insider status and the gained trust from years of activism that made them very, very effective at sending out messages and understanding community needs. They were able to mobilize their memories of the crisis, but also transfer them to new people. We are now in the process in which old time HIV activists who were already 30 or 40 years old during the crisis are on the verge of retirement. New activists who may not be in their early 20s need to gain those experiences and need to kind of adapt those memories that they do not have firsthand, but that they, they are getting uh, to know through that transfer of knowledge. There was a clear awareness of the differences between HIV and COVID, obviously, in terms of populations affected, rates of transmission, but also a lot about how those same things that applied during the AIDS crisis can apply to COVID, particularly how there was a changing evidence. Every day, the science developed, and what we knew today may change tomorrow and may change the day after. And that was something that was already happening during AIDS. So these activists had a very, very clear sense of how, in a very changing scientific landscape, how can they make messages that are effective and retain the trust of people. And something which was really interesting is that they saw their experience as being legitimized. So one of our participants said, I think that what COVID did for me, at least, was to reaffirm our, skill, uh, our skills and our knowledge in particular areas. We were able to transform the HIV side to COVID-19. If we did this for COVID, then maybe we can do it for diabetes and for queer migrants and for other communities. The model work works, the experience works. So what we are seeing is how through COVID they were able to understand the key skills and experiences from AIDS and from HIV, transform them into COVID and perhaps optimistically see how they can transform them to new, uh, to new epidemic. The report is now available online. You can scan the QR code. Um, but what was really interesting is that just as we were finishing this report, the monkeypox outbreak happened. And what we found is that it was these same activists who responded to the monkeypox outbreak because the UK government did effectively nothing. And, uh, and it was mobilizing this same knowledge that they had gained from COVID into, sorry, some of this from the UK government. They did something. It, wasn't great, but they did something. Um, so moving that same experience from HIV into COVID and then readapting it further into, um, into monkeypox. And that's how we are now leading a new project, a consortium across the UK, to explore how sexual minorities understood monkeypox messaging, develop uh, a relationship with those providing the messaging, and are taking out vaccines or failing to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, for a great presentation. Are there any questions? I think we've maybe got time for one question. Yes. I think I understand that, and I think there's a difference between AIDS and Ebola and other pandemics, and it's the communities that were affected. So in seeing the vast amount of people who died and still die from AIDS today, the fact that those lessons are not being applied just tells us how those lives are not considered worthy and valuable. Uh, whereas with Ebola, you would see every now and then um, politicians or policymakers or journalists making those connections more or less effectively. AIDS was almost always absent altogether from conversations. And in fact, they had to return to the flu epidemic of 1918 to give it a sense of history because, or our hypothesis is that they see those who die from AIDS 
as either deserving it, because they are the three H's, homosexuals, Haitians, um, heroin users that became common in the 80s, or just to ignore them because they are not dying in first world countries. So I think there's a larger equity issue around what lessons and what memories and whose memories we apply to, to new contexts. Thank you very much. I think um, we'll maybe move on to the next presentation now. Um, so thank you very much, Jamie. Yeah. Hello. So I'll let Amy to load up the slides. That's great. Sorry. And I'm very pleased to introduce our final speaker of the morning. So um, Kate McNeil from the University of Cambridge is a PhD student in the Department of Politics and International Studies. And her research focuses on the role of science advice in institutional decision making during health emergencies. Um, perfect. Just give me a second so that I can get the timer going. Um, I know that I'm the last thing before lunch and so don't want to keep anyone too long. Um, so. Um, for context, uh, as you all know, the COVID pandemic has been uh, a rare opportunity to conduct comparative research into science advisory systems in the context of a novel crisis uh, in developing countries uh, in de and developed con countries. So I'm looking at um, case study countries um, in developed contexts, Canada, the UK, and New Zealand being my focus points, uh, looking at the roles of evidence and uncertainty in the management of these crises. Uh, and I'm specifically interested in institutional roles uh, how they evolved during the emergency, um, and the ways in which uh, people who were involved in science advice processes were able to engage with policymakers, um, and who was brought into these processes, why and how. Um, so I've been doing primarily uh, elite interviews uh, with people who've engaged actively with different components of these systems. Um, this is involved uh, primarily speaking to science advisors, um, government officials, uh, and to scientists who have attempted to engage with these processes uh, through formal or informal means. Uh, in the New Zealand context, which is what I want to talk a little bit about today, um, I've gotten fairly far along within this process. And while trying to understand how people were managing uncertainty, um, one of the key things that has emerged um, is that people relied upon trusted pre-existing networks, uh, people that they knew as starting points. Um, these science advice networks started fairly informally. They were small at the beginning. And over time, um, systems became larger, more formalized. Um, subcommittees developed. Um, review groups popped up. Um, and different people got involved um, in defining who should be involved in these processes, what these processes should entail, and what they were for. Um, people who've been involved at key nodes in these systems have reported that over time, the larger these processes got, um, the harder that it was to keep up with recommendations emerging from them um, and to sort of make sense of overall inputs into the system. Uh, however, within this context, certain key stakeholders frequently fulfilled multiple roles acting as translators between different parts of these processes. Um, people might sit upon multiple committees uh, acting as a translator between what was happening on them um, and therefore being intermediaries. Uh, they also relied both on increasingly formalized networks um, within professional communities with people often acting as representatives of their disciplines and then going back to um, networks of GPs or people within their disciplinary communities uh, for advice and then bringing that back within to formal components of the system. Uh, and those people were then responsible for advocating for where where they saw gaps existing within the system, um, where they thought that um, types of evidence weren't being presented, uh, and for advocating for other people being then brought in. Uh, at the same point in time, people um, tended to rely upon data that they were collecting early on in the pandemic um, through very sort of sets of known entities. Uh, this is particularly the case in the New Zealand context because it's a small country. Everyone probably already kind of knew each other. Um, and people kept saying that here, um, usually if you needed to find somebody, you were going to find somebody that you'd heard of before rather than starting a search from scratch. Um, here, Twitter was reported repeatedly as mattering to people um, for finding new sources of preprints, uh, for finding people who are engaging with subdisciplinary questions as they were trying to find rapid answers. Um, 
and podcasts were also uh, a way that people both produced knowledge by participating in them and meeting other people who were involved in these networks um, and in accessing information in a rapid fashion. Um, so this is new ways of finding and participating in networks that are specific um, to sort of the age of the internet. Um, as well, uh, international knowledge networks existed both actively and passively. Um, so in an active context, people in New Zealand um, had ongoing uh, conversations with G7 counterparts, Five Eyes counterparts, but particularly close working relationships with people in Australia. Um, more passively, however, uh, in part because of where people tended to be trained or had past professional connections with, um, they were very interested in information coming out of the United Kingdom. Um, so even though the context of how the pandemic was evolving here was very different, this was a key reference point um, for people and finding sources of information that they were bringing into policy-making contexts. Um, so what's the point of doing all this, given that most of the science advisors or people who participated in this process probably have a sense of how it works? Um, essentially, by mapping who was talking to who, um, how people were able to access this system, uh, and looking at how this might function differently under crisis conditions um, as opposed to under normal circumstances. Uh, we can deepen our understanding of who's likely to be left out of these processes, who has an easier time engaging with them, uh, and how knowledge networks form through trust over time um, so that we can understand and better anticipate um, various factors um, for future emergencies, which may lead to certain voices uh, being excluded or represented or the types of information that are brought into these. Um, happy to take any questions or otherwise you can come find me at lunch. Thanks. Many thanks Kate for a great presentation. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one question if anybody has anything to ask at this stage. Yes, please. There is an assumption that access to knowledge expands rather than restricts your, your, your understanding. I, I, I'm not sure that's completely the case. Um, the, the, the fake knowledge networks are pretty well developed. Uh, implicit in Google, you know, you, you search for this, therefore you must be, you will like every other trackbox theory that's going. Um, it, we, we, it seems to be very much an echo chamber, even in the search engines. Um, not quite sure what the core of the question is there. So, Sorry. So I guess if you want to understand yeah. knowledge networks, you probably need to understand how fake knowledge networks also work. In a sense, because there, there is misinformation. Yes, no, there's definitely questions of misinformation. Um, and that's probably when I get to more of policy makers and media components of this research going to be a concern um, within sort of the advisory networks that I've been engaging in thus far, I'm looking primarily at scientists who are fairly established within institutions and how they were finding and screening through information. Um, one of the things that I am talking to them about uh, is how they were deciding to weigh different inputs within that system, particularly in the context where they were relying upon information that hadn't yet been through peer review. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kate, and thank you to all of our speakers, um, both for this session and this morning. Um, I don't know about everybody else, but I've really enjoyed it, and I've, I've learned a lot, so thank you.